Awesome, if you may take your seats, we're going to begin. Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Victoria Williams. I'm a program officer here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Really great to host you all this evening. Uh, we're pleased to uh, welcome our distinguished guests for this evening, Rachel Bronson, Christopher Crane, and Daniel Pohlman. Mr. Pohlman's latest book, Double Jeopardy, Combating Nuclear Terror and Climate Change, will be available for sale and signing after the program, just right over there by our partners, the bookseller. Before we begin, a few brief housekeeping points to share. We are on the record and we are live streaming. We welcome your social media engagement, but please take a moment to silence your phones. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. And later this program, uh, later in the program, we'll be taking questions from within the room and from online. So if you want to submit your question online, you may go to ccga.live, put that into your browser, and the URL is also on either side of the screens. And you can vote on questions that you like as well. Uh, so now to introduce this evening's discussion and panelists, please join me in welcoming Dan Mish. Daniel Mish is a member of the Chicago Council's Emerging Leaders Class of 2020. He's a federal project director for the U.S. Department of Energy and Argonne National Laboratory and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Dan is also a Navy veteran, having served as a submarine officer and nuclear engineer. I will return to moderate audience Q&A, but for now, please join me, Dan Mish. Thank you, Victoria, and good evening. If you didn't know, Chicago is the birthplace of nuclear power. In 1942, Enrique Fermi and his team created the first nuclear reaction at the University of Chicago under the stadium bleachers at Stagg Field. His research was thoughtfully later moved to the outskirts of town, or what used to be the outskirts of town, 30 miles west of here, where Argonne National Laboratory was founded. Researchers at Argonne subsequently discovered and developed all of the technology that has gone into making nuclear power possible around the globe today, including the submarine that I lived and worked on. It should come as no surprise today that Illinois has more nuclear power plants than any other state in the country. They contribute over 50% of our nuclear power, $9 billion to our state's economy, and 28,000 jobs. They also contribute 88% of our emission-free electricity in the state, and in fact, nuclear power across the country provides over 50% of our emission-free power. As we transition from fossil fuels to clean energy to fight against climate change, nuclear power is essential in ensuring that we have reliable and emission-free electricity to sustain our economy and way of life. But like all electrical power, it does not come without risk. The peaceful application of nuclear power creates concerns about waste, safety, and the proliferation of nuclear weapons to state and non-state actors alike. It is my honor today to introduce our speakers, all experts on these topics, to talk about how we can balance the good and the bad that comes with nuclear power, and how the US can maintain its leadership in the fight against climate change while considering these concerns. Christopher Crane is the president and CEO of Chicago-based Exelon Corporation, the nation's leading competitive energy provider. He has worked in the nuclear industry for over 30 years and has served in a variety of roles at Exelon since joining in 1998. Daniel Poneman is the president and CEO of Centris Energy Corps, which provides enriched uranium fuel to utilities that operate nuclear reactors throughout the world. Prior to this, he served as the U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy and as Special Assistant to the President for Nonproliferation and Export Controls on the National Security Council staff. And our discussion moderator is Rachel Bronson. Rachel is the President and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, where she oversees the publishing programs, management of the Doomsday Clock, and a growing set of activities around nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, climate change, and emerging technologies. Before joining the Bulletin, she served for eight years at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs in a number of capacities, including Vice President of Studies and a Senior Fellow for Global Energy. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. Good evening. Before we start, can I, um, I just want to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? All good? Great. Um, 
Well, I'm delighted to be here and honored to be asked to moderate this session, which I anticipate to be um, extremely interesting. Um, I thought I would just set the stage uh, for a minute or two and remind you um, that this year, uh, the Nobel Prize for Economics is going to an MIT professor, Esther Diflo, and her colleagues who won the prize for the cutting edge work they've done in lifting huge numbers of people out of poverty, for which she's receiving this great prize. What that should mean for all of us in that, this room is to think about the fact that all of those people are going to require greater energy intensity. And about 850 million people around this, on this planet don't have access to energy, and many are working very hard to make sure they get it. So we're moving into a world in which huge numbers are either have been pulled out of poverty or will be pulled out of poverty, a great ambition with real effects on the future of our planet. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us to think about how do we manage uh, the emission of uh, global emissions in this kind of moment. And that's in part what we're going to talk about today. So just a few statistics before I turn it over to um, the panelists. Um, BP's 2019 World Energy Outlook anticipates that GDP will more than double by 2040, dri driven by increasing prosperity in fast-growing developing economies. The International Autonomy, uh, Atomic Energy Agency anticipates a 42% increase in nuclear electric generating capacity will come online by 2030. Just about everybody es estimates that any increase in global energy efficiency will be more than offset by all, these, uh, all of the new demand coming online, particularly in India, China, and other Asian countries. And while the future of nuclear uh, energy in the US and Europe seems at this point somewhat gloomy, it certainly appears bright in China and Russia with significant geopolitical uh, consequences. So we're starting off our conversation tonight um, with Dan Poneman, who's written what I would say is a fantastic book that will be on sale after it. And I was describing it to someone as beach reading, but then I realized that that should probably suggested something <laughs> bad about me, that I thought a book on climate change and nuclear risk was beach reading. But I assure you, if you're interested in this topic, it's one of the most accessible books out there, and I highly recommend it. So Dan, your book is called Double Jeopardy. Um, it looks at uh, twin existential threats, uh, climate change and nuclear risk, both of which at their core have important things to say about nuclear energy. So why don't you open up, us, open up the discussion talking a little bit about what motivated you to write this book and why it's now the moment that you chose to write it. Well, thank you, Rachel. And I want to thank uh, the Chicago Council and Dan and Victoria for uh, hosting and the great work that led up to this session this evening. Uh, I've been obsessed since my earliest years as a summer intern for John Glenn by the threat of the spread of nuclear weapons. And there's always been a connection between the spread of nuclear energy and the potential spread of nuclear weapons because obviously the same processes that produce enriched uranium for commercial reactor fuel can be used to enrich uranium to 90% purity, which could be used for nuclear weapons. And at the other end of the uh, fuel cycle, when the spent fuel is taken out of the reactor, separated plutonium that could come from that spent fuel could also be used for nuclear weapons. So that's been something that's been an obsession of mine for over 40 years. In 2009, when I joined the US Department of Energy, we were engaged in a very intensive effort to curb climate change through the massive deployment of renewables. And so I became obsessed occupationally by trying to press that forward. We got $30 billion of loan guarantees out the, board, uh, out the door. We spawned the first utility scale uh, solar photovoltaic, the largest wind farm, et cetera. And as I was working on those issues, at the same time I was working on dealing with the Iranian nuclear threat, it just occurred to me that US leadership was going to be terribly important in addressing both of these threats. And that if we didn't manage that core set of technologies, atomic fission properly, we could not at the same time get the benefit of the deployment of nuclear energy to 
augment what renewables can do in terms of curtailing carbon emissions and not run the risk of excessive spread of nuclear weapons. So when I left government, literally the first thing I decided to do was to try to write a book that tried to reconcile how we could gain the massive climate benefits that are required if we are to successfully face this existential threat of catastrophic climate change, for which I believe nuclear power is indispensable, without at the same time unleashing the terrors of nuclear proliferation. So I want to spend some time uh, in our conversation uh, unpacking that and focus both on what's happening in the US and then globally. But before, Chris, let me turn to you and um, give us the landscape a bit about the nuclear industry. You think a lot about, uh, here in the States, you think a lot about uh, the, the jobs that are here as well as kind of the future of the industry. But maybe you can kind of set the table a little bit in terms of what we need to know to have an informed conversation about nuclear, uh, the nuclear landscape. Yeah, since um, Three Mile Island, the accident uh, on Unit 2, the industry has undergone uh, significant improvements in safety and reliability. Uh, the formation of the industry-funded oversight organization that sets standards of excellence, IMPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operators, really drives um, a level of safety and which drives a level of reliability um, uh, in an operational sense. Just to put it in perspective, prior to 1998, the Illinois fleet of nuclear plants had a 50% capacity factor. Now the capacity factors have been well over 90% for 15 years in a very high safety rating going forward. The industry, um, although uh, some of us compete in these power markets, we don't compete around safety. We share all our best practices. Um, we send all our operators and, and management to common training programs and we learn from each other. The board of IMPO um, is only CEOs of companies that own reactors. So it's a very highly focused organization um, and a, a industry. The problem we've had with um, the industry is the competitiveness of the electric uh, sector, the competitive markets, and being able to con be con compensated for all its attributes. Um, and and uh, Dan writes about in his book, I had a conversation with him, 2014 we had the polar vortex. We almost lost the grid uh, on the Eastern Interconnect because we couldn't get gas to plants, we couldn't get coal to plants, and, and um, or coal was freezing in piles, but the nuclear plants stayed up and ran. So the valuation that they should be getting for their resiliency or the valuation they should be getting for what they offset in the social cost of carbon um, is not within the market pricing. So we're competing against, um, and, and we have a renewable portfolio too. We believe in all of the above. We don't have coal, um, we have natural gas but uh, from fossil emitting, but we have mostly nuclear. Uh, solar, hydro, and uh, wind. So we think those are valuable assets, but having to compete against every other non-carbon emitting source as the majority of the carbon, uh, no carbon, zero carbon producing energy is a tough place in the market design that's existing today. And Dan, that, that, is, that concern is one that you spend a lot of time in your book thinking about. And so maybe you can take us through the journey. Um, you started by saying there was, in uh, 2009, a huge investment being made in renewables. Um, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about that and then what the, um, what the landscape looks like if nuclear goes away? In 2009, we had, uh, under the Obama administration, and in fact, in the current administration, you hear the same rhetoric, an all of the above energy strategy. Now, we already have uh, the largest fleet of nuclear reactors operating. At that time, we had 104. Now we're down, Chris, I think, to 97. 98. Oh, no, 97. We just, we just shut down Three Mile Island. Island down. 
And Thanks so that was, <laughs> that was up and running. Uh, and so uh, at that time, the major effort that we had in the Department of Energy was to see the resumption of the first commercial nuclear power plant being built since Three Mile Island. And these were the uh, plants uh, at Vogel and at that point, the VC summer plant in South Carolina, which have since been canceled. Uh, and so our commitment to nuclear was manifested through the, those uh, loan guarantees, but it had to be complemented not only by the renewable push that I mentioned before, but also by energy efficiency, uh, buildings emit 40% of our greenhouse gases and so forth. And then comes Paris. And if you take all of the 190-some pledges that the countries that joined the Paris Climate Agreement made to get to the target of uh, maximizing temperature rise over pre-industrial levels to 2 degrees centigrade or even better to 1.5 degrees centigrade, and if you stipulated 100% compliance with every pledge, turns out you missed the Paris targets by a country mile. And the very recent report that came out from uh, the United Nations suggests that, A, we're already way off track of those commitments, B, we're on track for something like 3.2 degrees centigrade over the course of this century, which is... We're back on. We need more energy. We need more energy. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, I guess I'll speak up. Victoria, the rest of you. <laughs> I can hold okay. it for you. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It's just We're going to make you work for a chance. Ambidextrous. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so the question presented, and this ties into the book, uh, if you want to close the gap. And let me just underline what a important thing uh, a few tenths of degree, uh, degrees can mean. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change last year found that if you achieve the two degree target, by 2050, we will lose 99% of the world's coral reefs. Indeed, the whole ecosystem would collapse. At 1.5 degrees, we might save 20% of those reefs and maybe have a chance to regenerate. So the only way to get close to the kind of targets that we need to get to is by a major expansion of nuclear energy. And let me just make one final point. This is not to the exclusion of renewables. It really needs to be all of the above. If you max out on solar, max out on wind, have tremendous progress on grid-level storage of energy to support the intermittent sources such as solar and wind, you still need all the nuclear because one thing people need to remember is we're in a big hurry. To your point from the opening remarks, uh, Rachel, we're looking at a 100% increase in electricity demand by 2050 over which period of time we need a 100% reduction in carbon emissions from power. And you just can't get there without all of the above. So Chris, the last kind of table setting uh, question for you on this is, can you just make sure the audience is up to speed on where we are in um, pre and premature closings in the US? And maybe you can then pivot us to the international, give us a sense of what's happening internationally. Sure. Um, for economic reasons, um, the plants of uh, eight reactors that still had life left in them have closed prematurely. Um, some were due to structural integrity problems that you couldn't get a, a return on the investment um, that uh, would have to be made. Um, and others were market design issues that aren't compensating uh, provide. So um, the, uh, the work that we've been doing is trying to move forward a legislative and a regulatory agenda that recognizes we can't get to where we need to go if we keep closing reactors. There's some promise. Um, it was announced today that uh, Florida Power and Light just received a 20-year extension that will allow the Turkey Point plant to operate for 80 years. Now, when people hear that a nuclear plant operates for 80 years, they become concerned of the age and what's going to happen. But we invest as an industry billions and billions of dollars on an annual basis in upgrading the plants. Um, the Exelon fleet uh, doesn't have the analog control systems that were put in 
30, 40 years ago, they're digital. The turbines have been replaced, the piping's inspected on a regular basis, cabling replaced, uh, and so it's constantly upgrading uh, the infrastructure to keep up with the degradation mechanisms that come into any high temperature, high pressure facility. So, um, you know, they're, they're viable, and we've got to find market-based methodologies to compensate them adequately for the social benefits that they provide to uh, the communities they serve. And, and maybe just, just to stay on this, because I think it's, it's an important point, um, nuclear power isn't competitive in the United States for several reasons. It's, there's alternatives in terms of natural gas that are putting pressure on it. Um, there's a choice that we're making by uh, certain market regulations and, and exactly what you've been talking about. And a third issue which um, comes up often is just these massive cost overruns that seem so inexplicable. So can you walk us through those three which are uh, difficult, uh, hard to overcome, I think? Yeah, I mean, uh, there was, um, as an industry, uh, as we started to see natural gas prices from 2004 through 2008 uh, considerably increase. And we thought at the time that the natural gas prices were going to meet equilibrium with the international market, which would have driven, driven support for construction of nuclear plants, even in a mer merchant market, um, a competitive market where you're not compensated until you produce a megawatt and sell it. Um, at, at the time, um, if you had an $8 a BTU <laughs> Uh, natural gas price in a $25 carbon tax, which was the Marky Waxman uh, framework, you could competitively continue to build reactors. Um, as uh, we got to the recession and the efficiency that was driven in to the extraction of natural gas collapsed those gas prices, it was no longer economic. Um, and so, but there were a few regulated companies that could justify the construction. Now, um, you know, it's, it's easy to be a, a, a backseat quarterback here, but the construction company and the, uh, 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 the supplier, the NSSS supplier company, was ill-equipped to have the talent to be able to efficiently build the reactors like they're being built around the world. Um, we used to do it very well in the States, and then we got post-TMI, and um, we three were mile, building- Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island, I'm sorry. Um, you, you think we get acronyms, you look at the front of his book with all the acronyms <laughs> in it, it blows you away. The nuclear industry is known for its acronyms, but, but uh, Three Mile Island, um, and then the changes that came in the design and the operator fundamentals, and, and, and so at the time of that, there was a massive build out and talent was very scarce. In my 20s, they allowed me to be a startup test engineer on uh, emerging reactors. And I'm thinking today, I don't think I'd let anybody in the, my 20s go do that, but uh, that was beside the point. So we, um, we, we, hit a, we hit a very tough spot for cost overruns in the 80s into the early 90s. And then um, we had the resurgent in the market and we thought we could do it. Um, we had, as a company, benchmarked a lot with Korea and Japan, where they can build a plant in 48 months, do it on schedule, on budget, and that's what you're seeing in Abu Dhabi right now. The skills internationally are there. We lost the skills or the focus in the country, and that's one of my number one concerns that we both have been sharing with the administration. The, the knowledge base is going away and we've got to rejuvenate it if we're going to make our climate goals and very importantly or just importantly be able to have a seat at the table on the international nuclear uh, in the international nuclear forum which we are losing very quickly to Russia and China. A perfect segue, Dan, for you. You're very concerned about losing American leadership, both on, uh, in terms of nuclear reactors and on the climate side. Why don't you talk a little bit about why, you're, why this link between our industrial know-how 
and how that translates into uh, a, glo a global leadership position. Sure, and, and I will uh, uh, pick up on uh, the point where Chris uh, left off because it's not to me inexplicable that we endured these cost overruns because 30 years out of practice of anything and you get slow and mistakes get made, the in infrastructure and the supply chains atrophy, the talent pool as well. So the question presented is, how does this affect our interests globally? And uh, we were talking in the green room about the global nuclear energy partnership that was started under President George W. Bush uh, when uh, Clay Sell was the Deputy Secretary of Energy. And the premise uh, had many aspects. The premise was nuclear energy, it's not a choice. It's a fact. There's uh, over 440 operating reactors globally. And if you like nuclear energy or if you don't like nuclear energy, you have to want two things. That if it's a fact, you want it to be safe and you don't want it to be spilling over into building bombs. And if you care about those things, you want US leadership because with no disrespect intended to any other player. Because as Chris said, we don't compete on safety. We're not supposed to compete on safety. We're not supposed to compete on nonproliferation standards. That said, our industry is all about peer review. And I would be proud to say that the United States has both <coughs> safety standards and nonproliferation standards second to none. So the premise I have is that if you want uh, to see the safest, most secure possible deployment and, and operation of nuclear power globally, you want to preserve U.S. leadership. Now, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of it. The order book uh, for nuclear power plants getting built yeah. internationally, there's over 50 of them getting built internationally. Now that Westinghouse finished the four units in China, the U.S. order book is zero. And the Russian order book, uh, reportedly, is on the order of $130 billion. If you take my particular segment of the industry, uranium enrichment, when I started as a summer intern in 1975 for John Glenn, we basically had domination over the not only the US market, but the whole global market outside of what we used to call the Soviet bloc. Now we don't have any indigenous technology that produces this enriched uranium. And in terms of who's ahead of us globally, we are behind the following countries in uranium enrichment. Russia, China, France, Great Britain, Germany, the Netherlands, Argentina, Brazil, India, Pakistan, Japan, North Korea, and Iran. Now, I don't know how many people know that, but I don't think that's where we want to be as a nation. And just as a point of comparison, when we had the first oil shock in October 1973, and U.S. dependence on imported oil rose from 27 to 35 percent. It was considered a national emergency. Here we have the U.S. nuclear fleet, which produ produces one-fifth of the electricity for the country and well over half of the carbon-free electricity, and we're utterly dependent on imports. And I don't think that's where we want to be. The, the situation is dire on that point right now, and we've had separate meetings with um, individuals in Washington and meetings together to describe it. Right now, if the Treasury goes forward and puts sanctions on companies doing business with Iran, um, the, in Russian, the Russian uh, enrichment company that both our companies are dependent on right now to meet our supply needs we would not be able to buy from. There is not enough global uh, enrichment capacity if you take the Russians out of the market. So we've got ourselves in a position that we are dependent significantly on the Russian export of enriched uranium to supply the nation's needs for energy. <clears throat> so. Many in this room know that, that uh, I have a particular interest in Saudi Arabia, but I think for, for this conversation, Saudi Arabia provides a really interesting um, case study for us to look at. Um, and, and the Middle East in general does. What, something that, um, that keeps me up at night is that um, the Russians are signing memorandums of understanding with 
uh, around in, in the nuclear space with um, Turkey, which they're 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 uh, further along on Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan. These are all presumably American allies that uh, the Russians are developing a um, pretty strong energy relationship. And we know how the Russians use energy. It's an extension of their national power and they turn it on and turn it off to, uh, we've seen them do that in natural gas and there's no reason to think that they, they won't do that it, 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 for, for other, um, other fuels. Um, so my question is, uh, what should be our, our policy in terms of helping the Saudis build uh, their, uh, their nuclear power? They want the full cycle. They've been very clear about that. That's when things get dangerous. Do we really want to be helping the Saudis um, who are in a very unstable part of the world and have um, beha been behaving lately somewhat badly, I would say? Do we want to help them do this? Um, or would we rather not and have them test, try their luck, look, reaching out to others um, and see how well that goes for them? Because the Russians haven't been terribly reliable in terms of building some of these as well. So how should we think about it? There's like, there's, there's real reasons to do it and real reasons not to do it, and I, I'd love to get your thinking on it. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sensitive conversation. Um, you look at the regime and some of the changes that are being announced in the regime and some of the things that they've been tied to in the press um, as still being repressive, oppressive, excuse me, um, that um, you would think that sanctions or not doing business there would be a good thing. Um, but then you have to start to look at um, what happens in the Middle East. Uh, and. As you said, we have good allies, partners, um, and from a security standpoint, with the looming threats of Iran um, on top of that. So um, there, there's, there's a balance, and what you have to ask yourself is, would you want to be involved in safeguarding the operations of nuclear reactors and safeguarding the security of nuclear reactors from a U.S. perspective in a, a volatile land, um, or do you stand on the principle based off of the oppression the regime has and you lose them to another entity? And so um, as a company, we've had some involvement uh, over the years with the uh, Saudis about safe operations, um, how we could, uh, as an industry, a U.S. industry, engage and help transferring that knowledge and actually p potentially transferring that service um, to operate these reactors safely. Um, also helping them with analyzing the grid. Um, there's one thing that you have to be confident of is the reliability of off-site power. And you have coping capabilities um, for uh, on-site power, diesel generators or gas-fired generators, whatever they are, to keep you through a coping period so you can cool the reactor down. But essentially, you know, the, the, the problem with some countries like Pakistan and others is the reliability of the grid with nuclear reactors operating on it. So there's many aspects that me um, coming through my career as uh, running and operating nuclear plants, um, I feel a confident uh, position should be, we should be at the table, we should be there. Um, the other political aspects of, of reforming the regime uh, can be dealt with in other forums, but not when it comes to nuclear safety and non-proliferation. Dan, I'm going to give you the last two questions, and then, and then we'll um, open it up. Um, the first is you've been involved in negotiating some, some of these kinds of agreements, and you've thought awful long and hard about them. So I'd love to hear your answer of how we should think about sure. nuclear power in unstable environments. So I go back to first principles, which is when it comes to nuclear energy, the United States is second to none in terms of safety standards and non-proliferation standards. The choice that other countries are making is not the United States or nobody. It's the United States or Russia or China or Korea, okay? And uh, I think not only for those safety and non-proliferation standards, 
but also in terms of geostrategic influence, which every other country in the world uses a 100-year relationship to build, operate, decommission a reactor to pursue, we have to be there. We have to be present. We already have the most powerful uh, standards possible. I do think that we have to be uh, very careful about the fuel cycle, as you said at the very beginning. And I would just offer a, a, a notion, an article that I wrote with uh, former Secretary Moniz many years ago uh, in 2004, in which we proposed a, an assured nuclear fuel services initiative. We have a glut of overcapacity of enrichment. That's part of the problem of the industry. And uh, the back end of the fu fuel cycle, the reprocessing, frankly, is not a very economic activity. But if you look at the existing capacity to do both of these steps, it's already there. So if you take the issue of the fuel cycle out of a sort of sovereignty test and turn it into a commercial deal in which you say, hey, you don't need for the next 10, 15 years to do these things anyway. It doesn't make sense to invest billions of dollars, for example, in enrichment uh, capacity if you've only got one or two reactors. So why don't you sign a contract with us and you'll get 100% of your requirements met. We can back it up with global guarantees from the International Atomic Energy Agency. There's now a fuel bank mm -hmm. that supports us in <clears throat> Kazakhstan. So if we come up with some creative ways, I think we can have the benefits of seeing what we need in terms of global deployment of nuclear energy to stem climate change without running undue risk on the proliferation side. So last question before we open it up. Um, uh, there is an impetus, uh, given the climate change situation, uh, towards nuclear power. And there's enormous risks um, as well. And so some of a lot of us think about, well, what would we need to see um, that would make us more confident that those risks would be mitigated? It's a big question to end on. but. Um, in your book, you lay out very clearly some, some key recommendations that you write that are doable, um, that can help us move in this direction where we could start to feel uh, more confident about achieving some of the things we've been talking about. And uh, you're one of the few who's really just laid that all out crystal clear that way. So I, I want to um, spend the last few minutes, why don't you talk to us about some of those key recommendations or the, the, the ones you want to leave us behind thinking about and, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Sure. Well, I think, frankly, uh, nuclear energy, I don't know if Chris agrees, we, ha we have a significant branding problem, <laughs> right? There's a, a new book out called A Brighter Future that, that goes through what enormous strides that Sweden made in cutting their carbon output by 50% at the same time as rising in Germany. And it was through a thing called Karncraft. <clears throat> and they uh, uh, added 600 kilowatt hour, uh, hours uh, per year to their grid when the massive expansion that uh, Germany did in uh, solar uh, only produced 120 uh, kilowatt hours uh, per year. So what was this thing, Karncraft? It was nuclear. So nuclear actually is quite safe. We've had uh, terrible episodes, but no one died in the Three Mile Island accident. And the tsunami, which was a tragedy uh, for Japan, the 18,000 people died from the tsunami, right? Chernobyl was different, uh, but that's an old reactor. But we have to address the public <coughs> concerns by demonstrating the safety of nuclear power. That's the first point. The second point is we need to deal with the waste problem. And, uh, you know, just to put this in some perspective, you know, the volume of all of the uh, used fuel generated since the beginning of commercial nuclear power in the United States would fill one football field seven yards deep. This is a political problem, not a technical problem. You can isolate uh, that used fuel long enough to have it cool down both in terms of heat and radiation. We've looked to uh, how it was done in Finland and Sweden where they basically reversed the problem and instead of trying to jam the site into an unwilling community. They had a consent-based process, and they ended up in Sweden, for example, having two communities bidding for the opportunity to host a repository. That's the second thing. And the third thing is you really have got to get your arms around cost. You know, Chris talked about in the days when we thought $8 gas and a $25 uh, price on uh, carbon emissions would do it. But the fact of the matter is right now, 
you know, nuclear power is way too expensive. We got to bring it down significantly. And here I'll just leave, leave uh, the conversation on this point, which we may take up later. There is uh, a new generation of nuclear power that's being developed. You've had many startup companies uh, looking at advanced generation, so-called fourth generation technologies, which uh, can be built uh, in a factory, which can be deployed in a modular fashion. And there is promise in using things like art, uh, artificial intelligence and 3D printing and so forth that we have to really have a step function improvement in cost in nuclear because otherwise, uh, even if you successfully address these other concerns, it's still not going to compete. And uh, unless and until we fix the market imperfections that Chris has articulated very clearly, um, we're really going to have to, even with, I think, market improvements, do just much better at curtailing the cost of deploying new nuclear. Great, thank you. Why don't I welcome Victoria back up and we can turn it over to a conversation with the audience. Awesome, so we have microphones uh, around the room and if you'd like to ask a question online, you can open up your browser at ccga.live and I'm actually opening up the conversation to the entire panel so Rachel will also be able to answer the questions. So we'll start right here, just right up in the front. So we, talk about the costs of nuclear, and at the same time, we talk about uh, we have to stay in the game. So how do you reconcile that? And how do you stay in the game when all the additional power in the US is you know, natural gas, wind, and solar? The, the um, valuing if, if you're talking about how do we keep the existing nuclear fleet in the U.S. in the game, um, there's a significant amount of work that's being done by the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is uh, the organization that works with the regulators, works on regulation, on looking at how we can advance technology and, and with all our digital systems that we have, um, and be able to remove costs while maintaining high levels of safety. That's a major focus along with the market design that actually values the, the low carbon output. It's, it's about um, 530 million metric tons of carbon that's being offset, 528 I think, uh, of carbon that's being offset that's a significant contribution to what the country needs to do. So allowing uh, a compensation mechanism, you know, if you get $2.50, $2 spot gas prices and you've got a efficiency of a natural gas unit, a heat rate transfer efficiency, um, it's very tough to deal in, in, um, uh, with those economics. So you can um, get a return on your capital invested for $22 a megawatt hour, and that's with a risk premium on that natural gas plant where the market prices are around $22. Our average nuclear price is now at $30. We're trying to get it down to $26, but you, you're just bleeding cash at a certain point, and we need to get those costs out. We need to get the efficiencies in the plants, which we're doing, but we also need to get the market to compensate it for more than the energy that it provides. It's the capacity and the environmental benefits. If you look at it from an international standpoint, we need uh, strong U.S.-based suppliers. The last U.S.-owned nuclear steam supplier uh, of the, the vintage that's operating today is General Electric. Westinghouse went through a bankruptcy. They're owned by a private equity company out of Canada. Um, they were owned by the Japanese uh, before they went bankrupt. And so being able to improve the ability for U.S. companies to export their technology, when you're dealing with uh, state-owned balance sheets, Russian subsidized, Chinese subsidized, even Korean subsidized technologies, it's very hard. You have to have access to the XM Bank. You have to understand the nuclear infrastructure is critical to the national security of the country. So having government support 
not, not bailouts, but government support for the economics of exporting it. General Electric is working on a modular type reactor design. It's a, a passive reactor that could be certified by 2021. Having General Electric or the factories that produce components for Westinghouse um, uh, up and running in the States not only helps maintain the infrastructure for the U.S. fleet, but it also maintains the infrastructure for something that's left out, and that's the U.S. military nuclear programs, the submarines, the aircraft carriers. Those are some of the same providers that are, that are staying alive based off of the U.S. fleet operating. So there's more to it. You can go environmental, you can go economics, jobs, um, uh, national security. That's what we have to do. And, and I think the U.S. fleet is really pushing to get the costs out, get the efficiency in while maintaining the highest levels of safety. Um, but the infrastructure companies do need the support of the government on exporting. Great. We'll take a question just right here up in the front. <clears throat> You've talked about the safety standards in the U.S., that they're as high as they could be. But without U.S. leadership today, who's setting the safety standards globally? And how's that affecting the doomsday clock? Okay. I can start, and then you can. Okay, go ahead. So, so um, I mentioned the organization that was started after Three Mile Island called the Institute of Nuclear Power Operators. Um, they drive the ever-increasing safety standards. We don't ever say we've arrived at the top level of safety. We continue to strive for greater uh, safety performance, safety system availability, incident evaluations, lessons learned, sharing across uh, all utilities. If we have an event, no matter the size at any plant in the U.S., it's shared very quickly with every other utility. After Chernobyl happened, um, the U.S. leadership was greatly involved with the French and, and other countries to create WANO, the World Association of Nuclear Operators. And WANO is taking the IMPO standards and bringing those across all of the operating reactors and doing pre-startup inspections on new reactors coming in. For the first time, we just, within the last year, completed the evaluation of every operating nuclear reactor in the world and making sure we understand its safety performance and leaving it with um, areas for improvement, uh, gap analysis and areas for improvement, and then doing follow-up inspections. There is the headquarters in London, but there's satellite offices in Atlanta, Paris, Moscow, and Tokyo, and there's a new one about to open in China to cover the Asian build. And, and that's where we get the insight. Um, the last couple of reactors to be inspected were Pakistan and Iran. And the issue was getting an international group that could go into those, or want to go in to those areas to make sure we could um, have a, a thorough inspection on that. So, but then you've got the IAEA. You want to? Yeah. Well, I think uh, all of it depends on peer review. I think, you know, Chris gave a thorough answer on both the domestic, the INPO, and the WANO in our acronym rich environment. I would just add another acronym, which is WINS, which is the World Institute for Nuclear Security, which is trying to do for nuclear security what these other organizations have done for nuclear safety. And it's all based, as Chris said, on peer review and everyone, frankly, keeping everyone else honest. And maybe I can just add something because of the reference to the doomsday clock. But one of the reasons the doomsday clock is set at two minutes to midnight, and there's, there's several, but one of them is the complete deterioration in U.S.-Russian relations. Um, and so that really speaks to some of the things we were talking about, right, that uh, the fact is that the entire arms control architecture is uh, collapsing, that we're investing extraordinary amounts of resources, both in the United States and Russia, in uh, our nuclear arsenals, and that our, our military postures are beginning to lean more heavily on a suggestion of nuclear use. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about? What it has to do with what we're talking about is that there is a climate urgency to um, invest in nuclear power 
But if we don't get these other aspects right, it makes it all that much harder. And what, what I'm trying to think about is, can we use the urgency of climate change to maybe build a different kind of coalition um, around arms control, the need for uh, a reinvestment in uh, arms limitation agreements around nuclear weapons so that we can begin to build a security climate in which we're more comfortable in advocating for nuclear power for climate change. We need it, and if we can harness what I believe is gonna be huge energy, no pun intended, in a movement for people concerned with climate starting to call for re-looking at nuclear power, we better get our, our security side of the house in order to, to make us feel more comfortable about it. Because right now, it's really, given the state of US-Russian relations, really hard to imagine how we let comfortably the United States just turns it over to the Russians to, to let them do it. So not to be utopian about it at all, these are really tough questions, but can we start using this climate urgency to drive a different security conversation? I, I think there's a possibility of doing that, and I think it's important to take some historical perspective here. During, for example, the Reagan administration, when we still had on the order of 25,000 nuclear warheads pointed at one another, the United States and Russia had a very successful uh, non-proliferation dialogue. In fact, of course, the Russians and the Americans worked together on drafting the nuclear non-proliferation treaty way back in 1968. So even at the height of the Cold War, we were able to find common cause around important principles, such as avoiding uh, nuclear obliteration. Um, interesting that uh, uh, President Putin has now suggested extending the New START treaty, which was an, an interesting uh, development. Interesting that when uh, Fordo, Chris was talking about the threat of uh, additional sanctions, but when Fordo announced that they were uh, resuming uranium enrichment, uh, Ross Adam, the Russian uh, nuclear state-owned enterprise, canceled their cooperation and said that they would not resume uh, until they had stopped uh, the enrichment, dismantled the cascade, and, and uh, decontaminated the facility. So uh, it's been a very rough road. There have been very rough patches, uh, especially after 2014 and the annexation of Crimea and so forth. But I would say this is a final point, and it applies to Russia and applies to China, that at various times, U.S. administrations have concluded that for the largest problems, that countries that are as important intrinsically by their heft and their activities as Russia and China will either be part of the solution or part of the problem. And we have to work very hard to make sure that they are part of the solution. Um, I think the stakes are just too high not to do our best to get there. All right, we'll take a question all the way in the back over there. Yep. Yep, it's coming to you. Uh, hi, my question is for Mr. Poneman with your comments in regard to Saudi Arabia as well. Um, so as we kind of figure out that climate change is a more global issue where every country, every country that can have nuclear energy needs to kind of team up and work together towards that goal. At the same time, you guys seem to be saying that um, if a country, we can't trust them with what we view as trusting them with this nuclear energy power, they don't really deserve to be part of the solution. Don't you think those two ideas are a little uh, contradictory of each other or no? Well, we have, we have a treaty regime. You know, it's the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. It's one of the most widely subscribed treaties, maybe the Montreal Convention on CFCs has more, I'm not sure. But that treaty basically vouchsafes to all compliant members the right to the peaceful use of nuclear energy. And that in exchange for safeguarding their activities and submitting to international inspections uh, and so forth, that they should be able to benefit from the peaceful use of nuclear energy. That's all that we're really talking about. In the aftermath of Saddam Hussein's violation of his treaty obligations, that basic treaty was augmented by other things such as the additional protocol that provided for uh, uh, challenge inspections and a uh, right to get to other places. After the Indian nuclear test of 1974, the United States ramped up all of its non-proliferation controls to insist that countries accept uh, safeguards over every nuclear facility in the country, not just the ones that were getting uh, assistance from, uh, from other countries. And so to the extent that countries 
fulfill and adhere to these nuclear nonproliferation norms, which do not permit diversion of peaceful nu nuclear technology to weapons users, and which use international inspectors and seals and cameras to prevent diversion, then I think we can manage the risk. You will never completely eliminate the risk, but the theory of International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards is that you can provide timely warning that if there is, in fact, a diversion of peaceful nuclear technology to improper uses, that the world will have time to react. That's what happened in the case of North Korea when uh, they uh, breached their nuclear nonproliferation treaty obligations way back during the Clinton administration, and that's uh, when they discovered the uh, clandestine uh, enrichment activities in Iran. That also triggered an international response. So there is no path without risk, but the treaty regime that has been established with all of the supplemental things like the nuclear suppliers group that provide strong export controls over dual-use items that could be used for either peaceful or military purposes, this is what we, we can do and, and we need to do as good a job at it as we can. And again, it comes back to the basic point that unless the United States is in there leading, we're not going to have the best that we can. And I think the, the premise is not that um, we don't trust, but you start off with the premise, trust but verify. <clears throat> okay, we'll take a question right here. Thank you all for being here. My name is Megan Kangura. I'm a plant geneticist and breeder by training. So right now the American Seed Trade Association meeting is happening here in Chicago. Plant breeders and scientists are trying to develop crops that can grow during global warming or that can produce more biomass for renewable energy. As a plant breeder, I'm all about breeding for global warming, but the renewable energies make me nervous because when Americans start putting fuel into their cars here with corn ethanol, it actually affects global food prices and global food security. So people think that renewable energies doesn't have a human health cost, but it does. So when we start consuming more ethanol, like made from corn, that takes corn out of the mouths of people in developing countries. And it actually has a human life cost. So could you talk a little bit about your thoughts of the impact on human health and global food security as it applies to renewable energies and nuclear power? I can start off by talking about, um, as an industry, electric generating industry, we are uh, very pro on uh, renewables, but renewables have limitations. And so those limitations are now having to be augmented by other sources. Um, you get your most solar, uh, if, you, if you develop the solar generation required to meet your summer peak, you um, actually overgenerate in the spring in the fall, and it causes the consumers uh, a, a great cost. Um, it, and so we are working on, uh, as an industry and as a company, investing in startups of other technologies that can take places of things like uh, fuel sources that either deprive from uh, a food source. I've read the articles about what's going on in Mexico with the corn. Uh, imports and the cost of the corn imports um, understand the issue. Um, but the, the other side is we're trying to electrify to be able to eliminate that kind of risk from fossil sources or from natural sources. Um, the electric sector uh, has reduced its carbon footprint from the number one producer of carbon based on energy efficiency, renewables, advancing technologies, and maintaining nuclear reactors by over 30%. If you look at the investor-owned, it's just about 30% when you look at uh, muni co-op municipals, that type of thing. So, you know, it, it's something we're focused on um, to, to relieve that. The other technologies um, that need to come into play right now um, to become more viable for the, the carbon reduction that we're talking about is a higher dependency on hydrogen and how can we economically produce the hydrogen for energy sources even if it's blending it with natural gas for a certain point of time to cut down on the fossil output. But those are the kind of technologies we're doing. You have a, a more keen focus on it than I do based on your background, but uh, 
we do understand the impacts of that <coughs> biofuels. Um, I, I know we're kind of at the end of time, but I think that's a perfect uh, place for us uh, to end. And let me just end with an anecdote. Anecdote: 2003, I was in New York working on uh, Middle East issues, and we were coming into the second Persian Gulf War. And there were real protests around uh, no blood for oil, no blood for oil, no blood for oil. And uh, very soon thereafter, we kind of hit the, the fracking revolution. And, and I was actually quite interested that I thought that there would be a groundswell of support for uh, U.S. Nat, uh, natural gas because it would take us off this, which was kind of silly at the time, but no blood for oil, a protest. But many of the same people who were against that then pointed out were then against fracking. And then I started thinking, well, surely then everyone will be behind hydro, right? Like hydro, and well, no, because that dams up the, you know, the waterways, and you have flooding, and it's terrible for for the animals. So um, then, you know, maybe there, it's biomass, but then it raises food prices, right? And so, okay, so maybe solar. But if you look at setting aside batteries and storage, if you set aside uh, that, the the amount of the amount of land use you have to take up to put all those solar panels out that would be required. So then clearly wind is, is the answer, but of course the, the turbines are ugly and it kills birds. And so very quickly we get away <laughs> from an all of above strategy to my belief where Americans really are is a none of the above strategy because energy generation is dirty and ugly and it all has costs. And I think we need to kind of walk through that and realize that there are a significant costs for every generation strategy we have. And that's why the administration came to an all of an above strategy that I don't believe effectively incorporated the benefits of nuclear and has kind of put us into this position where we then focus on one particular energy source at a time and we can focus on why we do or don't like it. So I think that is a perfect end to this conversation. Yeah, absolutely, which, and then, and then I know Victoria will shut us down. Uh, because What's actually happening in this all of the above strategy is it's not been all of the above, okay? So let me give one statistic. In 2011, California got 53% of its electricity from clean sources. That was a high level, but then California doubled down on wind and solar, and they ramped up both a great deal. They're global leaders. In 2018, the information has just come out. After all that effort for seven years, California now gets 53% of its energy, electricity from clean sources. And why? And this is happening in Europe, and this is happening everywhere. It's because you're having renewables take out nuclear instead of taking out coal and, uh, and fossil fuels. And after $2 trillion of investment in renewables, we've made zero progress. We're going the wrong direction. We're supposed to be going down to zero, and the emissions are going up. So until we stop the fratricide of pushing out one low carbon or no carbon source for another, we're going to be treading water at a time we need to be in a vertiginous slope down to zero. And so I, I think you know people have to be realistic about the fact that it's not just about uh, which energy you like, but how can you get to zero fastest? And the fact is we need to throw every carbon-free generator at this problem now. And that's where nuclear comes in. And with leadership of people like Chris in the industry, you know, we have a chance, but we need people to understand that we're just not going to get there if we keep displacing uh, one form of carbon-free energy with another. We've got to get the carbon out of the economy. Well, that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you guys so much for, for being here and important conversation to have here. Dan will be sticking around and signing books and we'll be selling some books over there. So please join me in thanking Rachel, Chris, and Dan. <laughs>